I lived in Los Angeles two years ago, and I learned while living there that there's a phenomena, a weather phenomena called June gloom. June gloom is the condition where the very hot desert air comes in in June, and it meets up with the cold Pacific air, and it puts forward what we would call pea soup fog, so thick that, as we say, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. One June gloom morning, I drove over to Santa Monica Beach to take a nice walk on the cliff above the coast there, and uh, June gloom was in full force and parked and began to walk along uh, the cliffs of the Pacific, but I could see absolutely nothing. I could not even hardly see my feet in front of me, and I certainly couldn't see the Pacific, but I was enjoying the cool air walking along the cliff. As I looked towards the ocean from time to time, I could see absolutely nothing. I could hear some birds, and I could hear some other sounds, but I couldn't detect anything. And then all of a sudden, mid-morning while I was taking this walk, the sun began to hit down on the fog, and as we know, began to lift it. And suddenly, I mean as if I could snap my fingers, I looked towards the Pacific, and I could all of a sudden not only see the water, but I saw this fleet of fishing boats that were anchored off the shore, colorful, beautiful fishing boats that were just several hundred yards away from my walk until a few minutes earlier when I could see absolutely nothing. And then it lifted, and I could see this incredible, gorgeous sight, stunning water and beautiful boats. Therein lies actually a parable of what can happen in regular, ordinary life, right? We're just minding our own business, walking our way, doing our routines, and then something happens. We become aware of something or some event takes place where we couldn't see through the fog, and then suddenly we're able to see clearly all kinds of things in front of us. How much, I wonder, do we fail to see God's bounty and what's in front of us because of some fog that's in our life? When I first led mission trips to Haiti, uh, I would often drive into the capital city of Port-au-Prince. It's a very large and bustling city. There's a main road, however, that runs right through the city. I noticed this one time when I went in for supplies. On the left-hand side of my driving uh, were these beautiful whitewashed walls with beautiful iron gates, massive tropical flowers everywhere on the left. And behind those gates were exquisite large mansions owned by Haitians and Europeans few Americans. On the other side of the road, as you look down, literally down a hill, is the largest slum in the Western Hemisphere called City Soleil. At one time, it was the city dump. When the population swelled so much to where there was nowhere else for the poor to live, they began to set up cardboard boxes and live in the stench and the smell and the sewage of city soleil. That one little strip of asphalt separated this exquisite sight from the worst poverty in the Western Hemisphere. I wonder, what is it that we don't see when we drive out of our gates and we venture down our roads and there's human suffering just across the road, just down the street, just around the corner, just on the other side of the tracks or on that other part of our city. What kind of fog bank comes in and doesn't enable us to see? We're told in our gospel text for this last Sunday of Epiphany, always the story of the transfiguration, that Jesus invited his three main disciples to go up on, we think, Mount Tabor. 
And there on Mount Tabor, we're told by all the other Gospels, not Mark, that they all fell asleep. And while they were sleeping, an event began to occur. The fog was lifted, their eyelids that were heavy and asleep one moment, then were lifted. What happened when their eyelids lifted? The person, Jesus of Nazareth, who they saw as just their buddy, their friend, their teacher, the one who got tired just like they did, the one who became hungry just like they would become hungry, the one who would thirst, the one whose muscles hurt at the end of the day, that plain old Jesus of Nazareth then was transfigured into something much more, into the Messiah, the Christ, transfigured into His full glory, we might say. There's a voice that speaks into this story that says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. The fog bank lifted. They were able to see clearly as to the full measure of Jesus. When their awareness became, when their fog bank lifted, when they were able to see the full glory of Jesus, they were given two gifts, we're told, in this text. One is the gift of trust, and the other is the gift of glory. First, the gift of trust. Jesus was transfigured. Peter, likely speaking for not only the other two disciples, but for all of us, then says out loud, teacher, it is good that we're here. Let us make three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But the transfigured Christ could not be held. We cannot contain the transfigured Christ. God is loose in our world, is not subject to our subjugation, is not defined by our narrow definitions is much larger than that, is transfigured in a gloriful way so that we can see more of life where the fog is lifted. And then Peter and the others and all of us are given the gift of trust. Trust me. I had a spiritual advisor once who said very little, but when he spoke, it was always important, kind of like E.F. Hutton in the commercials. You sort of pause and come close. And one day he said, you know, in the spiritual life, I've discovered that we can put our full weight down on the Christ, he said. And when we do that, we can hold all things else lightly. That made a lot of sense to me in terms of trust. I can put my full weight down on the trustworthiness of the transfigured Christ, and when I put my full weight, my trust down in that place, then I can hold all things else lightly. But Peter's instinct was our instinct. No, I can't do that. I cannot trust in these moments. I want to have a white-knuckled grip Let us build three booths, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. I want to control this situation, and yea, I want to control my whole life. I'm going to grab hold, and I'm going to take it to myself as my possession. And yet, what we learn in the story is that Peter and the others had to learn how to trust, how to let go of their grip and begin to see things larger, to put their full trust down on the trustworthiness of the risen, of the Christ, the transfigured Christ, and then they can hold all things else lightly. I wonder this morning, what are you holding on with a tight grip? believing that if you don't hold on to it tightly, that somehow it'll leave, it'll dissipate, it will die on you. 
And yet, what we know about all the things this side of heaven is that they're given as gifts to be used to be sure. They're given as gifts to enrich our life and help us to live our life purposefully. But they're to be held lightly as if to be given away in generosity. God gave them and gave us a first gift, the gift of trust. Jesus seems to give another gift to the disciples then and now, the gift of glory. We're told in the transfiguration that the glory of God shone around him in the other gospels. But glory is such a churchy word, isn't it? It's the kind of word we sort of lock into stained glass. We don't usually use the word glory out in our regular day life. In your work day, you don't say to someone, I saw the glory of God today. <laughs> they, they might be worried about you a little bit. And yet, that's the gift that Jesus seems to be given in his transfiguration. Can you imagine this morning, this transfiguration Sunday, that the Christ is holding out this gift for you, the gift of glory, wanting you and I to take it and to use it as a great gift in our life. But we might ask, what does the gift of glory look like in everyday life? It's not just in stained glasses, it is not just some word from the scriptures. It's something that you and I can detect, we can see, we can use. This past week I asked myself the same question in preparing for this homily. I wrote down some things of what glory might look like. See if these might resonate with you this morning. Dare to enjoy your life, I said to myself. Laugh more often. Notice beauty that's around you, not just the ugly, not just the trauma in Washington, not just the pandemic or people getting sick and dying. All of those things we know, in the midst of that, Notice beauty. When you, and, when you eat a meal in the coming days, eat slowly enough to where you can detect the seasonings that are in your meal. Listen for the oboe when you listen to symphonic music. Listen carefully. See if you can detect the oboe. I must have written this list while I was looking at my pet. I wrote down, watch your pet watching you. <laughs> Experience good architecture. There's some here in Jacksonville. There's some in other places as well. Look at the architecture. Notice its lines and how someone took great care to make that a beautiful building. Notice how shadows make life more interesting. Hum and whistle a few times during Lent. Turn off your electric devices from time to time. Say thank you at least a few times a day. St. Augustine said if we don't say hallelujah at least three times a day, then something's wrong. Discover the allure of water. We can discover it easily here in North Florida. If you're listening somewhere else, you might have to work harder, but take a walk along a lake or a river or a beach. Create something new during the season of Lent. Remember the first person who saw you through the toughest challenge that you've ever faced in your life. Remember that person, this Lent, and how you can be more like that person for somebody else. Remember the last time that you fell over laughing. Do you know Shrove Tuesday was built on the word laughter? The medieval monks called it carnival. They wanted us to have a good laugh before we started Lent. But also during the Lenten season, I invite you to remember the time that you cried the hardest, when you were really in pain. Remember what caused it. Remember who came alongside of you during those moments. 
What am I inviting us to do is to receive the gift of glory, that God's gift comes alongside of us in the transfiguration to say that life is more than it is now. It's not flatline. There's a lot of pieces to it we're yet to discover. There's part of our life yet to discover. There's more chapters to live. We will have chapters beyond the pandemic, folks. And in that sense, uh, we will have received the gift of glory. This isn't just an individual gift, by the way. These two gifts are given to the church as well. For the St. John's Cathedral, for us to be more of a trusting community, that the vestry and the dean and the clergy and the staff and all of our people would place our operative trust, put our full weight down on the trustworthiness of the transfigured Christ so that we can hold all things else lightly. And in the middle of some bleak periods, we can also as a community receive the great gift of glory. We can see God at work in the world about us. The story of the transfiguration is always told on the Sunday before Ash Wednesday. So on the eve of Lent, can we remember again that the transfigured Christ comes among us? Sometimes we have a fog bank, to be sure. We are walking along our path, and we can see absolutely nothing. And then, lo and behold, God's sun burns, begins to burn it away, and we are then surprised by joy to look towards the ocean, in my case, and to see the bountiful resources and beauty of God's world, to see it, and to hear those words again from the Spirit and the story, this is my beloved Son, listen to Him, follow Him, devote your life to Him, give yourself over to that mission in terms of generosity and mercy. Amen.